This PowerPoint begins with this slide of Little Ruby Bridges. She was only six years old when she was sent as the only African-American girl to go into, African-American person to go into William France Elementary School in New Orleans, Louisiana, September 14, 1960. It was a response to what the courts had ruled that these schools had to be integrated but there was tremendous popular opposition on the part of the white community. And no teacher would teach her except for one. Everybody else left the school. The teachers wouldn't be there in the school. And so the teacher who was there was a woman by the name of Barbara Henry. And uh, this little girl had to be accompanied by federal marshals to go into that school. There's a lot of consequences that came to her family as a, as, as a result of her going to that school. Her dad lost his job, and there's so much that could be said. The interesting thing is, as we deal with Ruby Bridges, she is not embittered. She is a life-affirming civil rights activist with a very optimistic uh, approach to life and a very forgiving approach to life, which is wonderful and refreshing. So this is a famous picture done by Norman Rockwell, who just, by the way, happens to have been my mom's art teacher. My mother is an art teacher in upstate New York, actually retired now, and this was her professor who taught her art. Um, but Norman Rockwell's picture has become famous. It's called The Problem We All Live With. And so this little girl had all kinds of racial epithets yelled at her. Dolls were held up as far as that were supposed to be dead African-American little girls. All kinds of nasty, nasty things done. The interesting thing is she'd been taught by her mom, and this is what she did. She just prayed for those people as she made her way into the school. This was an ongoing thing for quite a while, the opposition that came to her. And what she says is she says, thank God for the teacher that was there. That's Barbara Henry. She was my best friend and she taught me a lesson, the very lesson that Dr. King tried to teach each and every one of us. And that is that we should never judge a person by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That phraseology comes right from the I have a dream speech. She was white. She is still alive and she is my very best friend. She goes on to say, our kids know nothing about disliking someone because of the color of their skin. Each and every one of our babies, they come into the world with a clean heart and a fresh start in life. It is us, we as adults, who have kept racism alive. Believe it or not, it is us. We are responsible for the hatred that we see in this country today. She's saying that as a rebuke and saying that, that it, it lies within our power to change this. So these are pictures that are positive pictures from the civil rights movement. There's not as many of these as one would like. So you do see white folks in these pictures standing together with African American people in the protests and in the activism that's going on in the Southern Leadership Conference, of which at the time Dr. King was the head. His dad had been the president of it for many years, but he's the, the, the de facto leader of everything the, the SLC was doing. And here, we we see a picture of how things would become more and more in the future. But back then, these were rare pictures to see these white folks being supportive. And Dr. King is very conscious of that. So when we're dealing with Dr. King's approach to ethics and to this whole problem, what we're dealing with is the right side of this equation. We're dealing with ethics of character. When he talks about an unjust law is no law at all, that's coming from Aristotle, and ultimately it's through Augustine that Augustine, he quotes Augustine as saying this, but this idea comes even before Aristotle from Sophocles, and it's, it's a branch of, or it's a offshoot from, a tributary off of, the ethics of character side of the equation. So just we have to continuously come back to these three schools because your final exam is going to be based on you doing analysis of a moral dilemma from each of them. So on the far left is utilitarianism, which just to remind you that utilitarianism looks to the outcomes, to the consequences of an action before acting, and then decides what to do on the basis of that. Results determine it all. Deontology, on the other hand, still in ethics of conduct, what do I do? But it looks at one's duty, and it has a specific formula for identifying one's duty, using the uh, having a good will, and then using the two forms of the categorical imperative, it decides what to do. On the right side of the equation is ethics of character, virtue ethics. And for the virtue ethicist, he or she asks the question, what does it look like for me to be a woman, a man of character in this situation? And so it's about being rather than doing. 
And when we're dealing with natural law, which is what's raised by Dr. King in Letter from a Birmingham Jail, we're dealing with a, a, an Aristotelian concept, especially. And it's, so it's akin to, it's a kissing cousin to virtue ethics. So in dealing with the legacy of Dr. King, especially as regards uh, Letter from a Birmingham Jail, the first thing to see, and that's what this video is going to be about, is his perception of what the problem really is. His perception of the problem is, is that the good folks, the folks that you'd expect to be the moral folks, they're apathetic and they are just trying to sustain or maintain the status quo. And that that's really what the problem is. As you saw and you heard, if you've, if you've seen the video that introduces this module, the there were eight clergymen, both um, Jewish and Christian, who had written in order to say that they did not approve of what was going on in Birmingham, Alabama with a civil rights um, activism that was taking place at that time and the protests were taking place and that the African-American folks should go slower and not really, you know, roil up the waters so much. Don't cause so much commotion. And Dr. King gets this newspaper smuggled into him in the prison and reads about what they've said and is absolutely incensed and rightly so. So this is a famous saying by Edmund Burke, men here doesn't mean males, as it doesn't mean in Dr. King's speech either. This is an older way of speaking from back before, probably the 1980s or so. 1980s, it seems like in time is when we started to become more sensitive to these gender issues. But men here doesn't mean males, it means human beings. So the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Now I've lived long enough to see that worked out in business, in community, in schools, in churches, all over the place. That the only thing that's necessary is for those who are the moral individuals, the, the, those who would seem to be compassionate and sympathetic towards good causes, if they won't get involved, if they won't roll their sleeves up, then those who are not, and those who are immoral, are the ones who will have the power by default. And Dr. King says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. He means that it's, it's pervasive, that if you let injustice continue to go, it has the effect of bleeding over into other things. So he, his response in the beginning of the letter to these clergy is, he says, you deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham. I'm sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstrations into being the awful conditions of racism that existed in Birmingham, Alabama. I've almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's greatest stumbling block in the stride towards freedom is not, that should say, is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who's more devoted to order than to justice. And, you know, it's that justice should be what matters, not just keeping the peace. That's faking peace. And he wants to make peace, not fake peace, but make peace. This is language that his, he uses in his speeches. And so my, I hear his voice sort of when I read this because I've heard him say phrases like this. We must come to see that human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts and persistent work of men, remember that's people, willing to be co-workers with God. He's quoting the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians when he uses that phrase. He's a pastor, remember, he's a preacher. And so this is part of the furniture of his mind. And he uses phraseology that was very familiar to people in the USA back in that time. It comes through the tireless work and pers uh, tireless efforts and persistent work of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of forces of social stagnation. Hit the pause button. Remember when we looked at cultural relativism, one of the effects of cultural relativism is that it brings about stagnation ethically in a culture. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying that, that this, this effect of trying to just keep the peace is becoming that you're an ally of those who just want the culture to continue as it is. And there'd be no change that would take place in the culture. He says, we were not unmindful of the difficulties involved, meaning involved in trying to have a nonviolent protest. So we decided to go through a process of self-purification. I have a um, recording of him speaking to the B'nai B'rith in New York City and explaining this, this process of purification in depth. And what he says is that they basically, they role-played. They had individuals from the African-American community who would behave like prison guards would and like police would towards those who uh, were 
acting out being protesters. And if somebody couldn't take seeing the women groped and called hoes and um, having the men be spit upon and those kinds of things, they got fired. They acted out the things that these white guards would do. And if, they, if the person had an explosion of anger, they knew they didn't want that person involved. This needed to be absolutely nonviolent. So he says, we decided to go through a process of self-purification. We started having workshops on nonviolence and repeatedly asked ourselves the questions, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? What are the ordeals of jail? Well, many of them were thrown into a cell in gang style, like, a, like a four or five of them in a cell, and one toilet and no enclosure around the toilet, men and ladies, primarily men. And so what they did, here's, it's interesting, they anticipated all these things. That being the case, that was meant to humiliate and to dehumanize them. So they would create a wall of people around that person using the toilet who is sitting down and having to defecate. And so there'd be a wall of your friends in that cell with you, around you, to keep the people who are going by from being able to see you. They, they thought all of this out very well. They, they put a lot of effort into it. It's fascinating. He said, well, I'm going to back up and stay there. So this idea of nonviolence, where did it come from? For Dr. King, he had um, seen it put forward uh, in especially the, the thought of Gandhi, of Mahatma Gandhi. And he went to India in order to make contact with leaders in India. 1959 is when he does this. And he, he meets with Jawaharlal Nehru, who is the Prime Minister of India at, the, at that time. And he meets with the Vice President of India, Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, and speaks with them about where did, where did um, Gandhi get his idea of nonviolence? And it's kind of fascinating. He is a Christian clergyman. You can read about this in the book Let the Trumpet Sound by Stephen Oates, um, which is a, a biography of Dr. King. And they kind of are surprised. and They say, well, we thought you were a Christian clergyman. And he says, well, I am. He said, well, he got it from Jesus, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Um, so the, Dr. King travels to India to find out where did this idea of nonviolence come from. And it came from the one whom he is a clergyman representing. But this, it was very essential to this whole movement that it would be absolutely nonviolent. So he goes on to say in this letter, just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, we must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies. Pause button. Who's... Who's the gadfly of Athens? It's Socrates. So this man's invoking Socrates. We must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. He says, again, I want to re reiterate, that shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. The fact that you don't get it and you're not on board with us and you're not empathetic and you're not going to support us, this cler these clergy, that is more dis damning and, and more uh, of you and frustrating to us than it is to have these people like Ku Klux Klaners who oppose us. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. We get the people that hate us, but you're supposed to be the people who are our, our allies. In your statement, you asserted that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But can this assertion be logically made? Isn't this like condemning the robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Isn't this like condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical delvings precipitated the misguided popular mind? 501 is the, the number of the jury of his peers. Precipitated their mind to make him drink the hemlock? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to his, meaning God's will, precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? So it's, it's victim blaming, right? We must come to see as federal courts have consistently affirmed that it is immoral to urge an individual to withdraw his, her efforts to gain his basic constitutional rights because the quest for them precipitates violence. Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber, not the other way around. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate, 
Or will we, will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice? Or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? He's trying to poke them and provoke them. He says, I'm thankful, however, that some of our white brothers have grasped the meaning of this social revolution and committed themselves to it. They are still all too small in quantity, but they are big in quality. These names would be worth you looking up. They're fascinating individuals. Some like Ralph McGill, Lillian Smith, Harry Golden, and James Dabb. So these are newspaper publishers. These are pro college professors. These are authors of books. Some of them have written about our struggle in eloquent, prophetic, and understanding terms. Others have marched with us down nameless streets of the South. They, they meaning white folks, have languished in filthy, roach-infested jails, suffering the abuse and brutality of angry policemen who see them as, and you, you can see what the phrase says there, they, unlike so many of their moderate brothers and sisters, have recognized the urgency of the moment, meaning you haven't, they have. They get it, and you're out to lunch and sense the need for powerful action, action antidotes to combat the disease of segregation. But despite these notable exceptions, the, the minority, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. Well, there's a lot of people who are disappointed with the church, and it's easy to criticize the church, but most of that usually goes on from people outside the church. Here's what he says. I do not say that as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say it as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in its bosom and who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings and who will remain true to it as long as the cord of life shall lengthen. Again, he's using biblical language that comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. Over the last few years, I have consistently preached that nonviolence demands the means we use must as be as pure as the ends we seek. He's saying, you can't accuse me of doing anything ethically wrong. I have been completely ethically in the right. So I've tried to make it clear that it's wrong to use, I'm not a Machiavellian, it is wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends. But now I'm going to flip this on you. Now I must affirm that it's just as wrong, or even more so, to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. You're in the name of, of keeping the peace, you're preserving immorality. Wake up! This is a famous poem by W.B. Yeats. And this is just a, a selection from it. It's, the poem is called The Second Coming. And at a certain point in the poem, it speaks about turning and turning in the widening gyre, circle, circle. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed. And everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. It's a picture of chaos. And then it says, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. That's a perfect description of the environment in which he is dealing. The best, or those that we take to be the best, they lack all conviction. While the worst, you know, like the Ku Klux Klaners and those who are hateful, they're full of passionate intensity. And he wants the white folks who are supposedly the moral ones, the best, that they would wake up and they'd be full of passionate intensity. This is a famous poem of sorts, it's, it doesn't rhyme, by Martin Neimuller, who was a, a pastor in what was called the Confessing Church in Nazi Germany in the time around World War II. And actually, this poem isn't true of Neimuller. Neimuller is kind of famous for being in jail. A similar thing ha happened with Henry David Thoreau. Um, but Neimuller had the experience of a pastor whom he knew who came and stood out. So, so I'm, I'm saying Thoreau went with something, through something like this in the United States uh, that parallels this. But he had this pastor who came and stood outside of the uh, the jail cell where he was being held because of his opposition to um, Adolf Hitler. And Neimoller depicts what happened to people in Nazi Germany who were the good folks by writing this. But again, this is not what he was like and not what he did. First they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. He says, then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. When they locked up the social democrats, I remained silent. I was not a social democrat. Then they came for the Jews, Kristallnacht. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. That's the erosion process whereby if we don't speak up and unite with people who are being oppressed, ultimately the oppression may come our way. This is Nelson Mandela. He says, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid. 
but he who conquers that fear. And so in a sense, you could say that Dr. King was trying to provoke these folks to bravery, to moral fortitude and courage to do the right thing. And in the second video, I will get into his brilliant and timeless response as regards the law and will actually engage natural law. But I just first wanted you to see what he was, his diagnosis of what was wrong.